Alright, hey guys, I hope you're doing well. Today was a really nice day outside. I did some dancing. Uh, my cousin and I went canoeing, so that was a lot of fun. Um, so we are going to start chapter four. I upgraded my phone recording to my camera and we have a really professional setup here of a few boxes and gift cards for height, so we'll hope that goes well. We have the last of the really great Wang Doodles, and we will start with chapter four. The house was marvelously interesting. To the left of a wide staircase stood a complete suit of armor. There were portraits on the walls, and it was easy for the children to guess that they were ancestors or relatives of their host, since the resemblance to him was unmistakable. There was a round table in the center of the hall, overflowing with books and magazines. The brass centerpiece was bursting with orange and red and yellow chrysanthemums. The man ushered the children into a small room. There were so many books that there didn't seem to be space for anything else. Yet, there was also a desk with a swivel chair behind it and a large globe of the world standing in the corner. Three complex and wonderful mobiles hung from the ceiling. The man motioned for them to sit down by the fire. You'll have to sit on the carpet, I'm afraid, he said. You see, I never have more than one armchair in here. It discourages company, though, of course, I'm very pleased to see you this evening. He sat down in the chair. Now, let me see if I can remember your names. You're Melinda, and you're Benjamin, right? Ben and Lindy nodded, and... Oh, dear, he paused as he looked at Tom. Is it Teddy? Thomas, sir. Thomas, of course, silly of me. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Professor Samuel Savant. Ben gasped. Golly, are you the Professor Savant, the one who works at the university? I am. Dad was telling us about you the other day, Tom said. Was he indeed? Yes, where's your prize? Lindy asked. My prize? She means the Nobel Prize, sir. The professor chuckled. I won't be receiving it for a while. But come now, I am most interested to know how you found me. We didn't know this was your house, said Tom. We were out trick-or-treating, explained Ben. Tom bet me 25 cents that I wouldn't knock on the door, added Lindy. I thought an awful witch lived here. A witch? Mrs. Primrose, are you a witch? The professor asked as the sweet-looking woman entered the room with a tray. I sometimes think I'd like to be one, sir, she said with a smile. Mrs. Primrose gave a steaming mug of hot chocolate to each child and placed a plate, a plate of cookies on the floor in front of them. The professor sipped his hot chocolate. Mmm, that's good. So, you thought a witch lived here, eh? Ben felt embarrassed. Everyone at school thinks this house is haunted. Their host suddenly became serious. I'm afraid I'm responsible for that rumor. You see, I do hate to be bothered. I need a lot of peace and quiet when I'm working. What do you really do, asked Tom. Well, I think a lot. That's not much, said Lindy. On the contrary, it's a great deal, replied the professor. Right now I'm thinking about life. I ask myself questions about it, its origin and its meaning. Believe me, that takes a great deal of thought. Ben leaned, er, he leaned forward in his chair. Do you know that the secret of life has almost been captured? It's part of the alphabet now. Have you heard of DNA and RNA? I think so, sir, Ben said, but he looked puzzled and Tom shook his head. DNA. That stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Good word, huh? The professor grinned. What does it mean? Ben wanted to know. Well, let's see if I can explain it very simply. The professor touched the tips of his fingers together as he gave it some thought. Try to imagine a human cell, a single, a single microscopically small unit of life. Inside the nucleus, the very center, is a sort of ladder, a ladder twisted into a spiral. On that spiral is all the information as to how life comes about. That's a bit too complicated for me, said Tom. It is indeed complicated, answered the professor. Actually, it's miraculous, and DNA and RNA are the codes to life itself. I always thought life had to do with G-O-D, said Lindy in a clear voice. Oh, my dear, the professor laughed and touched her head gently. I'm sure it does have a lot to do with G-O-D. Believe me, I think about him a great deal, too. But, however life began, and some scientists say it was by an in incredible accident, and some say it was by God's design, we do have the unique privilege of being on this earth right now, and that's something we shouldn't take lightly. I like life very much, declared Lindy. She was a trifle confused by all the talk, though she was trying her best to understand it. There's only one thing I really hate, and that's P.E. 
P.E. Physical education. Oh, I see. I'm absolutely no good at it, complained Lindy. I'm always being forced to do it, too. Tom spoke in a disgusted vo tone. Lindy, that has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about. I know, I know, she fibbed. I hope P.E. is the most serious problem you ever have to contend with, the professor said. He paused and then asked, what do you suppose is the most serious problem that grown-ups have? The children gave it some thought. Tom said, ecology. Daddy says it's too much starch in his shirts, said Lindy. I think it's the hydrogen bomb, said Ben after a moment. They're good answers. Ben is the closest, I think. But there is one thing more serious than that. More serious than the hydrogen bomb? Ben was surprised. Oh, yes, indeed. You see, in a very short time, the scientists who have discovered the secret of life in a very short time, the scientists who have discovered the secret of life will be able to make life. Then, in a way, we'll be playing G-O-D, as Lindy so aptly puts it. That's a huge responsibility. And we must hope that people won't be foolish. You know, the mind is a thing of extraordinary beauty. It has taken several million years for the human brain as we know it today to develop. Now all we have to do is learn how to use it properly. Nobody in the room spoke for a while. The fire crackled noisily. The professor seemed lost in thought. Suddenly, he came out of his reverie and addressed himself to Tom. Did you look up Wang Doodle in the dictionary as I suggested, young man? Tom smiled knowingly. I did. And it doesn't make sense. Dad says a Wang Doodle probably doesn't exist. Of course it exists, the professor declared. I told you it did. Well, where is the Wang Doodle? Where does it live? challenged Tom. Professor Savant looked at the children for a long moment, as though trying to make up his mind about something. Then he leaned back in his chair, closed his eyes, and said quietly, The Wang Doodle lives in Wang Doodle Land, where he is the king. He is the only animal left of his species, although there are other wonderful, fascinating creatures that live with him. There are gazooks and sidewinders, tree squeaks and swamp gaboons. There is an animal called an oink and another called a proc. They have hardly ever been seen. In fact, they would do anything possible to avoid mankind. So far, they have been remarkably successful. The boys were enthralled. Lindy was so fascinated that she gazed at the professor with her mouth open as he continued. Hundreds of years ago, things were very different. Man believed in magic and miracles and folklore and legend. Myths and witchcraft and the spirits and such were all quite real because people believed in them. There were many Wang Doodles. They were found mostly in China and Greece, Africa, England, and the Scandinavian countries. Later, I believe, there were some Wang Doodles found in the islands of the Pacific. The professor opened his eyes and stretched his legs toward the fire. The popularity of the Wang Doodle was probably at its height in the Middle Ages, when people also believed in animals like the unicorn and the wyvern and the great rock and the hippogriff. The Wang Doodle was said to be the wisest, the most generous, and the most endearing of all the creatures. As the years passed, man became involved in technology and agriculture and industry. Of course, it was natural for him to want to learn about his environment and the laws of nature, about the universe and how to get to the moon and so on. But as he brought in the new part of his mind, so he closed down a beautiful and fascinating part of the old, the area of fantasy. The more knowledge man gained, the more self-conscious he became about believing in fanciful creatures. People began to think that things such as dragons, goblins, and gremlins didn't exist. The terrible thing is that when a man dismissed all the fanciful creatures from his mind, the Wang Doodles disappeared along with them. But where did the Wang Doodles go? cried Lindy. By the time the Wang Doodles and the other animals realized what was happening to them, it was almost too late, said the professor. There was a tremendous upheaval. The dragons and the monsters became fearfully anxious, and they made a great fuss and fought with each other and killed or destroyed themselves by the thousands. Which was no help at all, of course. Many of the wonderful creatures from the past just faded away from sadness and neglect. That is why only a few remain today. King of them all is the last of the really great Wang Doodles. Being very wise and very clever, he retreated to a realm where man could not see or harm him. But if no one can see him, how do you know he's there? asked Lindy. The professor took a moment to drink the last of his hot chocolate, then he carefully set the cup to one side. I know he's there because I have been to Wangdoodle Land. The children sat in stunned silence. He continued, 
I have not actually met the Wang Doodle. He's elusive, and of course he's as anxious to avoid me as I am determined to try and meet him. Well, where's Wang Doodle land? Lindy whispered. How do you get there? The professor smoke slow spoke slowly and distinctly. There is only one possible road you can take, he said, and that is to go by way of your imagination. But that's ridiculous, Ben cried. You couldn't use your imagination to go anywhere. Tom said in a disbelieving voice, that's just impossible. No, it isn't. Nothing is impossible, replied the professor. In fact, I have a saying in my office, whatever man imagines is possible. I've proved that hundreds of times in my work. Okay, then how do you do it, challenged Tom. I had to go into training. I had to stimulate and teach my mind to become aware and open to any possibility. I was like an astronaut preparing to go to the moon. Think how long they study before they begin their journey. That's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. The professor jabbed a finger at the children. Two hundred years ago, who would have believed it possible that man could get to the moon? It would have seemed just as fanciful as my saying today that I have been to Wang Doodle Land. But man imagined going to the moon, and now it's a reality. Lindy asked a vital question. But do you suppose we could ever get to go to Wang Doodle Land? Do you suppose ordinary people like us could ever see it? The professor smiled, a secret smile. Yes, I believe you could, he said casually. It would mean a great deal of hard work, but you're young and you actually stand a better chance of getting there than most adults. Your imaginations are vivid and fresh, and you haven't closed your minds to possibilities the way so many grown-ups have. What would we have to do? Tom asked cautiously. You would study with me, said the professor. We would have to meet each day and work hard. When I thought you were ready, we would begin trying to find the Wang Doodle. But you would have to do exactly as I say. More importantly, you would not be able to mention this to another living soul. Couldn't I tell Mummy? asked Lindy. The professor shook his head. No, Lindy, it would spoil everything. You see, most grown-ups would not, indeed they could not, understand what we would be trying to do. Then how come you understand so much about the Wang Doodle? demanded Tom. Because I am different. Some people consider me an eccentric. I specialize in imagination. I imagine things most people wouldn't even dream of. Like DNA and RNA, said Ben. Precisely and the Wang Doodle. I have made it my life's work to study this extraordinary creature. I'd love to see a Wang Doodle, Ben said thoughtfully. Gosh, what a thrill that'd be, to be the only people who've seen it in all these years. I still don't really see how it's possible, said Tom, but it would be fun. What about Lindy, though? Do you suppose she could go? She's too young, isn't she? Of course I'm not, Lindy protested instantly. I'm old enough to go, aren't I, Professor? I would think it important that you go, Lindy, he replied. Being the youngest, your imagination is the most fertile. You could help where the rest of us might fail. See, she turned in triumph to her two brothers. But wait a minute, the professor held up his hand. I have not said that you could go. The children all spoke at once. Oh, please, professor, do let us. We'd love to go. We'd do anything you'd say. The professor deliberated a moment. Finally, he said, all right, but there have to be conditions. First of all, I must be in complete charge. Secondly, you must tell your mother that we have met this evening and that I will be telephoning her to discuss your coming visits. I think that, is, that it is correct and it will save your parents worry. The third condition is the one I have already mentioned. You must not talk of this to anyone. Is that quite clear? The children nodded. Then I see no reason why we should not try this experiment together. I should just add that, once committed, there can be no turning back for any of us. He turned to Tom and Ben. Are you ready to take on that responsibility? Without a moment's hesitation, the boys nodded. The professor looked at Lindy. When can we get started? She asked e eagerly. The professor walked to the study door and called for Mrs. Primrose. He said politely, I'm afraid that I must leave you now. Ah, Mrs. Primrose, I would like you to jot down the telephone number of my friends here, and then perhaps you'd show them out for me. He smiled at the children. I shall expect you after school on Friday. Goodbye for the time being. Goodbye. The children were left with the feeling that there were a thousand questions they would like to have asked. The evening had passed so rapidly. It was already late. Professor Savant walked quickly up the wide staircase of his house until he came to the third landing. 
He passed through a draped archway and proceeded to climb a narrower f flight of stairs until he reached a small white door. He took from his waistcoat pocket a key on a silver chain and, inserting it into the lock, he let himself in into a most unusual room. At the far end, at the top of the spiral staircase beneath a wide skylight, there stood a large telescope pointing to the heavens. Next to it was a large planetarium globe. A bench in the center of the room contained a most complicated series of beakers and flasks. Against the right wall stood a pyramid of cages containing white mice, a hamster, a toad, and one extraordinary multicolored rabbit. Hanging from the ceiling above the bench was an amazing structure. It resembled a finely wrought stepladder and it was made of different colored plastic segments, all brightly illuminated. A high-backed wing chair faced away from the door. The professor closed the door behind him and approached the chair, speaking in a quiet voice. So sorry to keep you waiting, Proc. I had some unexpected visitors. So I gathered, said a distinctly unusual voice. A unique figure rose from the chair in one sinuous movement. The visitor was tall and exceedingly thin. He had a long, narrow face which accentuated his large black eyes and prominent nose. He had a long body and very long arms. His legs seemed permanently bent at the knees and his shoulders hunched forward. His hands were limp, the fingers thin and tapered. The stranger wore baggy pants and a loose turtleneck sweater which did not sit comfortably on his narrow shoulders. On his head, a battered gray trilby hat was pulled down at a rakish angle. So, you're thinking of taking those three to Wangdoodle Land, eh? He said. His voice had a stretched, echoing quality, a rasping whisper that seemed to hang in the air long after he had spoken. I'm not going to try and do that. I was considering it, yes, replied the professor easily. Well, you're a fool, said the proc rudely. Except for you, no one has ever reached Wangdoodle Land, and no one ever will again. You're wasting your time, and you'll find yourself saddled with children who will turn out to be a big nuisance. That's a possibility, said the professor, but on the other hand, we could just make it, my friend. Humph. The proc looked bad-tempered. It's a clever idea. idea, I'll grant you that. One thing's for sure, you'll, you'd never catch the wangdoodle on your own. And I'm going to do everything I can to stop you and the children. I'm not even going to mention this to his majesty. He'd only fret. I wish you'd tell him that I mean no harm. I'll do no such thing. The proc was highly indignant. Can't you see why you're so anxious? Can't see why you're so anxious to pursue this idea of yours anyway. Why don't you just leave us in peace, he grumbled. But I've no intention of disturbing the peace. Can't you see that, said the professor. It's not only you we're worried about, the proc continued. If you make it to Wang Doodle Land with the children, what's to stop others from doing it? It's too big a risk to take and I won't allow it, he snapped. Nevertheless, I do intend to try this experiment. The professor was quietly adamant. Right now, I don't think there's a thing you can do about it, Proc. Not now, no. The Proc was distinctly annoyed. But I'll be waiting for you and you won't get far. He wagged a spindly finger at the professor. Those children won't be so easy to teach, although I'll enjoy watching you try. In fact, I'll be watching everything you do from now on. He eased himself to the door with a slithering, sliding walk. I'm going, he declared. This whole conversation has given me a terrible headache. Without even bothering to say goodbye, the proc drew himself up to an immense height, and then, as if being pulled by an invisible hand, he slid down to the floor in a single motion and disappeared through the crack under the door. Chapter 5. Chapter 5 is also pretty long. We'll try and get through part of it. Mrs. Potter was thrilled when the professor telephoned to ask if the children could come to tea. She asked them again and again for details of their visit. What is the professor like? What did he say? What kind of house does he live in? They told her all they could without once mentioning the wangdoodle. It was hard on Lindy, for she was very excited and she desperately wanted to tell someone about their plans. But her brothers reminded her of the professor's warning and she remained silent. The following Friday after school, Ben, Tom, and Lindy found themselves back at Stone House. The professor is out in the garden, Mrs. Primrose said cheerfully as she showed the children into the lounge. She opened the French windows and pointed to a small pavilion on the other side of the lawn. He's over there. Hello, hello, hello! The professor's head popped up over the trellis. Come and see what I've got. 
The children ran across the grass. Professor Savant was kneeling on the floor of the summer house, playing with a large, multicolored rabbit. Oh, Lindy dropped to her knees. Isn't he beautiful? What's his name? asked Tom. Sneezewort. He lives in my laboratory. I hate to see him in a cage all the time, so I bring him down for a walk as often as I can. Where did you get him? Ben wanted to know. Sneezewort is the result of a study I did in crossbreeding, the professor said proudly. His great-grandfather was a Belgian hare and his great-grandmother was a Himalayan black and white. I went on from there. You should have seen the combinations I produced. He chuckled. Lindy held out a rolled piece of paper that she had been carrying. Here, Professor, I did a drawing for you. She shyly handed it to him. It's a wang doodle. Why, Lindy, how nice! The professor unrolled the paper. But that's wonderful. That looks very much like a wang doodle, but you've left out his bedroom slippers. Bedroom slippers? asked Tom. Yes, he always wears bedroom slippers. Actually, he grows them. And each year he grows a different pair, a different color and a different style. Lindy drew in her breath. That's fantastic. It is, isn't it? agreed the professor. And what's more, the wang doodle never knows what the slippers will look like until he has shed the old pair and grown the new. It is a surprise even to him. The children hardly had time to digest this piece of information when the professor continued. There's one other remarkable thing about the wang doodle. He can change color whenever he feels like it. It's a safety device. He can blend in with anything so no one can see him. Lindy whispered, What color is he normally? Oh, a sort of warm gray-brown. Rather ordinary, really, the professor replied. But of course, if he's feeling cheerful, he can turn scotch plaid if he wants to. The children laughed delightedly. He sounds such fun, said Lindy. He sounds like such fun, said Lindy. Does he have a beautiful palace? Well, I've only seen it from a distance, but it is rather remarkable. Lots of turrets and things, you know? Does he live there alone, Ben asked? Oh, yes, totally. Lindy was concerned. Doesn't he get lonely? I would think so. Why is the Wang Doodle a king? asked Tom. Because he's the best of all the creatures. I told you about that, remember? So he's very smart? Smart? I should say so, the professor replied emphatically. Could you grow a pair of bedroom slippers? Or change color? Could you preserve peace? Yes, indeed. He is quite remarkable, and if we are ever going to see him, we must get to work. The children seated themselves beside the professor, and he pointed to the garden. First of all, take a look around, he said. A very good look. Now I want you to tell me all the colors that you can see. Benjamin, I think you should begin. Ben had the feeling that he was not going to be very good at this kind of exercise. Well, he began hesitantly, I see the gray house, brown trees, and a blue sky. Oh, and green grass, of course. Is that all? Well, I see a dark brown roof and the curtains at that window. Tom, what about you? This white summer house, Tom began, and I see a sneeze wart, a green door, er, that's all, except for what Ben said. The professor turned to Lindy. She took a deep breath. There are the white clouds in the sky, and those leaves are golden. There's a bird with a red-brown chest. Your logs over there are sort of yellow. Those flowers are orange and white. They're late, they're late chrysanthemums, said the professor. We'll have a look at them in a moment. But first of all, look at the trees again. They're not just brown, are they? That one there is almost black, and the trunk of that one is copper and smooth, and that one is gray and rough. Those dead leaves are a russet color, aren't they? Now look under that hedge there. Do you see anything? The children looked. They saw nothing. Can't you see the cluster of red berries hanging up under the leaves? The children looked closer. Suddenly, as if the focus were being changed on a camera, the red berries came into their view. Why didn't I see them? Tom was bewildered. Because you weren't looking, replied the professor. There aren't many people in this world who really know how to look. Usually one glance is enough to register that the grass is green and the sky is blue and so on. They can tell you if the sun is shining or if it looks like rain, but that's about all. It's such a pity, for there is texture to everything we see and everything we do in here. That's what I want today's lesson to be about. I want you to start noticing things. Once you get used to doing it, you'll never be able to stop. It's the best game in the world. The children found themselves beginning to share the professor's excitement. He spoke with such passion and enthusiasm. 
Every walk we take from now on, every place that we go, he continued, I want you to tell me all that you see. Even this close to winter, you'll be surprised how much color there is. In the town, there will be shops and rooftops, flags and curtains and bright lights, traffic signals, balloons, the colors of cars and the clothes people are wearing. In the country, there will be color in the leaves and flowers and trees, under the hedgerows, under the hedgerows, by the wayside in the grass. He pointed to the ground. Ben, look closely here. See the earth between the blades? See how rough and hard it is after the frost? Think of being as small as an ant down there. Look at it as if you were indeed a beetle or a worm. Wouldn't the earth be different to you then? Wouldn't it be a whole new countryside? The lumps of, oops, the lumps of clay would be mountains and the blades of grass would be a forest. Ben stared at the ground and to his amazement he saw what the professor meant. I've never thought to look at it that way before, he said. He was completely fascinated. The professor slapped his knee. Well, that's just my point. Nobody thinks to look. He turned to Lindy. Tell me what you see in the hedgerow there, Lindy. Do you see anything beyond that opening in the branches? Can you see how the shadow on the grass makes it look as though there's a path in there and that it might lead somewhere exciting? Lindy looked at the hedge carefully and concentrated hard. The light and shade played strange tricks on her eyes. There was a shimmering quality to the afternoon and her head felt a little fuzzy. It seemed to her as though the hedge began to move, to twist into a different shape, like a tunnel. She leaned forward, mesmerized. For one second, she was convinced that if she could just go through the tunnel, she would come out in a new and unknown land. She was so excited that she looked up at the professor to tell him about it, and as she did so, the spell was broken. What is it, Lindy? The professor watched her keenly. She turned to look at the hedge once again. She frowned because the illusion wasn't there anymore. All she could see was the green hedge in a perfectly plain winter garden. That's funny, she said. I thought that... She stopped, aware that the boys were staring at her. Well, it's not important. I guess I let my imagination run away with me for a moment. Professor Savant looked at her thoughtfully. Then he turned and walked onto the lawn. Come and look over here, he called. I want to show you something. The children followed him. He moved to the small clump of chrysanthemums that Lindy had pointed out earlier. He picked a beautiful white one on a thick green stem. Look at this. See how sturdy it is. A flower that blooms this close to winter has to be strong. He handed it to Lindy. Ben shifted his weight from one foot to the other. I think flowers are a bit sissy for a boy. Which is wrong. The, professors moved to, the professor moved to sneeze wart and picked him up. Let's go inside and I'll show you something that just might change your mind, young man. Have you started science in school yet? We began last semester, sir. Good. Bring that flower with you, Lindy, he commanded, and walked briskly into the warm house. The children followed him as he climbed the three flights of stairs to the small white door. And we will finish this chapter later. It's been about a half hour and I don't want this to go too long. So I'll put my bookmark in. We'll finish chapter five in a little bit and I will see you guys tomorrow. All right, have a good day and start noticing things just like the professor challenged Ben, Tom, and Lindy to do. All right, bye.